Hello everyone, I'm Robin Pearson from the History of Byzantium podcast. It sounds like you're in the mood to hear about great warlords who founded dynasties and ran huge empires. If that's true, then you might want to check out my show, as we have all that and more. If you want to hear about what happened to the Romans after 476 AD, then visit thehistoryofbyzantium.com or search History of Byzantium wherever you get your podcasts. For now, back to James. The Karakum Desert is the 12th largest desert in the world. It measures about 350,000 square kilometers, or about 135,000 square miles. Today it can be found almost entirely in the country of Turkmenistan. In fact, about 70% of the land of Turkmenistan is the Karakum Desert. Geographically, this desert lies to the east of the Caspian Sea, south of what's left of the Aral Sea, and west of Transoxiana. Karakum means black sands, as a thick layer of black sand lies beneath your fairly normal-looking yellow-brownish sands. The desert is hot in the summer, freezing in the winter, and has a pretty small population both today and back 600 years ago. And indeed, humans have lived in and around this desert for thousands of years, digging deep wells and traveling to and from oasis to oasis in order to live. And among these nomadic traders and Bedouin shepherds, sometime around the year 1363, Timur likely fled from the fertile lands of Transoxiana into the eastern reaches of this desert. With Timur was his wife, the princess Aljai, and a handful of his closest friends and servants. But other than these few companions and his name, Timur had pretty much nothing. His bids for power under the, under the Mughal Khan had failed the first time and backfired the second, and now, either by corrupt plots by his enemies or by his own stubborn will, Timur was an outlaw forced to flee. But for all the attributes Timur is remembered for showing, giving up is certainly not one of them. And he had one last hope that might restore his prestige and position. His brother-in-law, Amir Hussein, grandson of the great Amir Kazagan, and former ruler of Kabul, may still be alive. And Timur knows that if his brother is alive, he will be somewhere in or around that ocean of black sand. Welcome back to the Timur Podcast, a show that investigates the 14th century Amir Timur, his character, conquests, and legacy, among other things. I don't really have any new announcements for us today, so let's just jump right on into this thing. As you and I have seen time and time again, there are portions of Timur's story that are shrouded in mystery. I know, it's so annoying. His birth and early life are prime examples of this. Nobody alive at the time took really any notice of him or enough to actually write things down. He was just yet another warrior boy of the steppe. And as such, pretty much every source we have that talks about those periods of his life come decades later and are most likely written by people who didn't know Timur as a boy. So we can guess about the details, we can infer what his early life may have been like, maybe, by comparing it to what we know about the culture at the time, and maybe we can even accept a few of those crazy stories that come from the later legends about him, but in the end, it's mostly just mystery. Now, once Timur becomes the great emir of Transoxiana, or Mawarnar, and begins his conquests in almost every direction, more and more mystery, becomes history. Because we've got Armenians and Arabs and Georgians and Indians and Egyptians and Turks and a whole host of other people, enemy, enemies and allies of Timur, who left their own records of him. Then we've got archaeology, diplomatic correspondences, paintings, songs and poems, architecture, and a thousand other things that help bring Timur's later life into the confirmable pages of history. But today's content, and some of the next episode as well, I would place somewhere between these two situations. For of Timur's life between the years 1363 and 1365, we're fairly certain of the rough details, but the specifics might be true, or might be myth, or might be both. 
So at the end of next episode, I'll share with you the general details that historians agree on. But for now, let's jump back into the story and see what our sources say about this three-year period, which I have dubbed the Desert Years. And keep in mind that some of the stories we may hear are probably myth. But I've chosen to include them anyway, one, because they're great stories, two, they might be true, and three, and most importantly, they give us some nice glimpses into Timur's personality. So with that, let's begin. In 1363, we find Timur trudging through the eastern reaches of the Karakum Desert. With him was his wife, the Princess Algai, along with a small band of faithful servants and his most loyal friends. They had horses, food and water, some jewelry, and plenty of weaponry, but make no mistake, they are now fugitives in a hostile land and possibly with a bounty over their head as well. But looking at what happens, I wish that I could give you a riveting story about how Timur and his band traveled for months, looking for his brother Amir Hussein, just barely missing him here, almost finding him there, and then after it all, they accidentally run into one another, or, or something like that. But unfortunately, all of our sources well, all they say is that Timur found Hussein, probably quite early on. I know I left this as this big cliffhanger last episode, but Timur finds him. That's about it. Now, while the desert is a bit of a big place, it is actually pretty believable that they were able to link up so quickly. As we will later see, Timur and Hussein, but especially Hussein, were recognizable men. The traveling Turkish and Persian Bedouins might very well have recognized them, or at least recognized the name, thus being able to give directions to Timur as Timur goes searching. And in addition, we will also see that Timur and Hussein often had backup plans, places where they were to meet should things go poorly. So even though the sources don't confirm this, I can totally see these two men having a secret meetup position in the desert should their plans collapse. Whatever the case, though, Timur and Hussein were reunited at the city of Kiva, or Hiva, which is in modern-day western Uzbekistan. And what's important to note about this position is that they are now on the fringes of Mughal territory. The Mughals are just not as well established here, which means that Timur and Hussein might be a tad bit safer. Now, Hussein and Timur, with both of their parties combined, have about 60 men at this point. But this number does not include anybody else other than the soldiers. There may have been other non-combatants, maybe dozens of other people. But the only non-soldiers that are listed by name are Timur's wife, Aljai, and Hussein's wife, Dilshadaga. The point being that they do have some martial strength, enough to maybe fight off some robbers, but not anything they could take cities with. So here they are, two disenfranchised refugee, refugee brothers-in-law, there we go, with a few dozen followers. Now, like I said a moment ago, Timur and Hussein might very well have been recognizable. They had both previously governed or outright ruled large portions of land, both had commanded large portions of troops, and maybe some of those troops had returned home to the nomadic lifestyle once the campaign was over, or on the other hand, maybe the Mughals had sent word out promising reward for the capture of these two outlaws. Regardless of how word gets out, it did get out, and the governor of this place, Kiva, was a man named by the sources as Tekil, and one way or another Tekil heard word that Timur and Hussein were in his lands. And who knows how much the moguls would pay if he could deliver Timur and Hussein in chains to them. So our two brothers aren't given any moment to rest, for Tekil immediately rides out to capture them, and with him are 1,000 Kievan horsemen. Timur and Hussein see these large clouds of dust getting ever near and quickly gather their people together. Everyone get on your horse, we're being pursued. But as they're hastily trying to leave the well they were at, they see the cloud behind them getting ever larger. I like to imagine Timur and Hussein looking over at one another with no word spoken, both men knowing exactly what the other is thinking. We must stand, we have to fight. So quickly they turn around and prepare for battle, if we can call this a battle, for this is 60 men versus 1,000. Nevertheless, string your bows, throw the packs off, get the women to the adjacent hill, and now prepare yourself to boldly meet the embrace of death. Now, although we are 15 episodes into this thing, I know we haven't really talked at all about steppe tactics, weaponry, armor, and just how the Mongols and Turks and other nomadic people were able to dominate the world for centuries. We will. We'll have several episodes that dive solely into these subjects, but I'm waiting until we get to Timur actually having an organized army before we get into steppe warfare. 
For now though, know that the bow was the primary weapon of these warriors. Swords, maces, lances, and axes were also used, but their whole style of fighting was centered around the bow, hitting hard from afar. And if their adversaries weren't able to respond with the same amount of ranged weaponry, then small amounts of these mounted archers could take on much larger armies and annihilate them. Now these 1,000 men with Tekil were likely armed with bows. But were they as skilled as Timur and Hussein? Possibly not. Timur and Hussein were noblemen who had been on several campaigns, fought in several battles, and most of these 60 men with them were probably men who had fought alongside them. Further, if the number 1000 is true, and it probably isn't, medieval authors love to exaggerate, but let's say that it actually was an overwhelming amount. Well, if you are Tequil in this situation, Come on, you know you've already won, why not have some fun with it? Hold some of your guys back, let it be somewhat more of a fair fight just so you can laugh about it later. Why not, you've got nothing to lose, this battle is so clearly won. Now I'm just throwing a few possibilities out there. The sources don't give us much to work with, but what they show is that the two forces engaged in Timur and Hussein aren't instantly wiped out as you might expect given the numerical differences of the forces. But Tekeel and his officers held back to watch instead of jumping into the fray themselves. As for the men engaged in the battle, the Zafranama gives us a few little details that are quite neat. Two of Timur and Hussein's men, one named Taji Boga Barlas and the other named Safaidin, are mentioned by name for distinguishing themselves among the rest. As the arrows began to fly in all directions, several of these arrows collided with the horses of these two men, throwing the riders into the sand below. Now, without the mobility and the speed of your mount, the danger you were in increased dramatically. Nevertheless, instead of running or trying to find other horses, both these men stood up and continued to shoot while on foot. And that first guy, Taji Boga Barlas, well, his name tells us that he, like Timur, was of the Barlas clan. I wish we knew his story and how long he had known Timur and how he now found himself in this situation and whatever happened to him. And maybe he shows up later and I just haven't gotten to there yet, but for now all I know is that he's this badass warrior. Another one of Timur's men is also listed here by name, Elchai Behader. And Elchai, like the two others, had his horse shot out from under him but refused to flee, jumping up and firing from the ground at the circling enemies. And apparently he continued to fight so recklessly that Timur himself sees him and had to act. So Timur rides up to him among these, the rain of arrows, dodging and weaving. And once Timur gets to him, he grabs Elchai's bow and in, with one swift movement cuts the bowstring and signals for Elchai to fall back. And with no bow, Elchai had no choice but to do so. But meanwhile, Hussein is looking at the situation and comes to the conclusion that even though their men are fighting like wild animals, unless something changes, they're still going to lose. So Hussein decides to ride directly to cut off the head of the beast. This is what the Zafranama reads. Hussein collected all of his strength into his arms and rushed full speed on Tekil. Hussein split into the enemy's flag and struck terror into the most courageous. And for a moment, Tekil's assault faltered as his men saw their commander's banner fall to the ground. But then they quickly rebounded and surrounded Hussein, who was now desperately trying to fight for his life. And then, Timur, sword in hand and with a few of his men, plunge into the men surrounding Hussein and fight through to him. But as they are falling back, Hussein's horse gets shot and collapses, flinging Hussein to the ground. Hussein raises his sword and begins to hold his ground, and then, seemingly out of nowhere, Hussein's wife comes riding in. The wives of Timur and Hussein, along with the other non-combatants, had been watching this whole battle take place, and it's at this moment that Hussein's wife decided that she needed to intervene, and it's a good thing she did. So she comes riding in, and Hussein jumps onto the horse, and they retreat. Once far enough away, she gets off, and Hussein rushes back to the fight with his new mount. Meanwhile, Tekeel is trying to push his men forward for the final assault, but before he can give the orders, Timur and Hussein and their dozen or so guys who are still alive reform and charge directly into their enemies. The Zafranama continues. Timur, whose valor and good fortune had never let him miss an opportunity of acquiring glory, turned about in his perilous condition he found himself in, and with an invincible courage rushed into the midst of the enemy's troops, with his sword in one hand and his bow in the other. 
And as they're charging in, Timur raises his bow, loses an arrow, and watches as it plunges into the face of the terrified Tequil. And as Tequil falls and begins to crawl on the ground, writhing in agony, Timur plunges a spear into his back, which, as the Zafranama so colorfully says, joined his body to the earth. The banner had been one thing, but now that they saw their leader dead, Tequil's warriors fled. Hussein and Timur were somehow victorious, but of their 60 men, only four could be found, and Timur, Hussein, and these four men were all wounded to some degree. Now let me interrupt this incredible story by pulling the brakes and switching gears entirely. If you've made it this far into the episode, chances are that you're either enjoying the podcast or at least getting something out of it. And if by chance you would like to help the Timur podcast out, there's an easy way you can do that. If you listen to other podcasts, then I'm sure you know what's coming. But it's true, ratings and reviews really do help out the show. So if you've got a minute or two to spare, it would help the show out a ton if you were to leave a rating or review on whatever listening platform you use. Not every platform has a mechanism for leaving reviews, so don't freak out if you can't find it. But if you're on Stitcher or Apple Podcasts or even the Facebook page, they have nice little systems you can use to rate the show. Now, as for why this helps me out, you'll hear all over the place that reviews help other people find the show. But I've also heard that this is a complete myth. I don't know, I've heard different things, but what ratings do accomplish is that they give the show legitimacy. It indicates that people listen to the show and that I'm not some strange man yelling in his closet about Mongols. They have to prove that. Trust me, that's... I'm not that guy. But anyway, they also absolutely make my day whenever I see these reviews. The feedback makes this all so worth it. Okay, so sorry about the interruption. Let's get back to Timur. After the battle, our party regroups, gets the most wounded people on horses, and limps back into the desert. The next day, they come across a well, and here they find another three of their men who had been separated from them during the fight. But this momentary joy quickly backfires as Timur and Hussein wake up the next morning to find that these three men had fled in the night and had stolen all of their horses. So, Timur and Hussein decide that they probably need some sort of new plan. They don't have many followers fit for battle, they just lost their horses, and most importantly, they're in a place where people can, and have, recognized them. And on top of all that, word is probably circling now that these two guys just defeated an entire Kievan entourage. After talking over their current situation then, the two come up with a new plan. They're going to split up for the time being just so that they can get away from Kiva. Hopefully being separated will prevent them from being identified together, or at least maybe one of their parties can escape should the other be captured. And if they're able to meet up again at the rendezvous position, well, from there they can decide what to do next, but for now we need to worry about actually surviving until that point. But with that, the two men part ways, with Timur taking only his wife Aljai and one other follower. I don't need to tell you this, but this is a pretty terrible situation for Timur to be in. Someday, he will arguably be the most powerful man on Earth. Yet here he is, with two people, no horses, alone in the desert. After some traveling, night begins to descend, but the trio sees tents in the distance. Hungry, thirsty, and eager to find shelter, they cautiously approach the tents. Timur tells Eljai to hide behind a small hill while he and his companions see if the tent dwellers are friendly. And then they walk to the tents. They peek into the first tent, look in, and see nobody. Odd. They edge their ways in a bit further, but then a cry of alarm breaks the silence. Turkish Bedouins come rushing out of the other tents, bows and swords in hand. They quickly surround Timur and his friend. Timur draws his sword and raises it in defiance. They're not going to go down without a fight, at least. And so the circle of men begins to tighten slowly as Timur continues to move so that he's facing whatever man is closest to him. Wait! Someone cries out. And everyone pauses, because out from the circle walks a man who is clearly the leader of this group of Bedouins. This was Haji Mehemet, a man who had encountered Timur years before, maybe even had known his father Taragai. The men quickly put their weapons down, apologies were made, and hospitality rolled out. Timur went back for Aljai and then returned to the Bedouins, and for the rest of the night they feasted, drank, and Haji Mehemet told Timur all he knew of the politics of Transoxiana that had transpired in Timur's absence. 
Timur gave Mehmed a bracelet as a gift, and Mehmed gave the trio horses, a guide, and supplies to help them along their journey. And so the next day, Timur set out again. Timur arrived at the rendezvous location, a place called Mamodai, and Hussein arrived shortly thereafter. And they stayed here for about 12 days or so, so their horses and followers could rest, and Timur and Hussein could have enough time to think of their next move. They decided to take the Khorasan road to the region of Khorasan, which is located in modern-day northeastern Iran and some of the surrounding Central Asian countries there. Here in Khorasan, or Horizon as it's sometimes called, they would be safer as this area was not controlled by the Mughals. Khorasan had been a part of the former Ilkhanate, and when the Ilkhanate collapsed in 1335, about 25 or so smaller kingdoms had risen in its place. Oh, and you know what, actually, here, uh, let me make a quick note. I was recently listening to a lecture, and the speaker referred to the Ilkhanate as the Ilhanet. And that is probably the more correct pronunciation. I'm going to stick with Ilkhanate, though, as this is what I've been calling it, so hopefully that'll avoid some confusion. And at least where I went to school, this is how I heard it spoken. But again, I have a tenuous grasp on the 21st century American English. Uh um, I just proved it there. So just bear with me as I stumble through some of these words and phrases. Anyway, so Timur, Hussein, and their little band of followers are off on the Khorasan road. But before they get very far, a man named Ali Beg, ruler of a place called Makan, hears that they are nearby. And probably knowing that the Mughals would offer a hefty sum of gold for these two captives, Ali Beg gathers 60 armored horsemen and rides out in pursuit. And again, Hussein and Timur sees that the enemy horsemen and are, are behind them, and both men know what this means. But unlike the last time where they were able to put up a good fight and actually win to everybody's surprise, this time they knew they didn't stand a chance. Their numbers were less than 10 men, their men were tired, and the enemy was too strong. So as Ali Beg and his soldiers surround Timur and Hussein's party, the two men lay down their swords to surrender. And what happens next is one of the lowest points in Timur's life. It could very well be the lowest point. The group is separated and cast into a dungeon. It appears that Timur tried to fight to protect Algi, his wife, but they were forcibly separated. And once inside and alone, things only get worse. This was the middle of the dry season, so the heat becomes unbearable. Bugs and vermin were crawling everywhere, and it was almost pitch dark inside. But Timur survived the first day. Then another day went by. And another. And another. And another. Then a whole week goes by. And then another week. And then a month. And we, of course, don't know what Timur was thinking at this point, but I can imagine his hope for survival was dwindling with every passing day. Did Ali Beg actually want to sell them to the Mughals, or did he have other plans entirely? Where was Hussein, and where was Algi? Was she alright? Was she alive? But his questions were not answered, his cries to the guards ignored. Timur was left to rot. And, unfortunately, that is where we are going to have to leave Timur until next week. Next week's episode should be a bit longer, as there are quite a few more events in this Desert Years portion of his life that we need to cover, including how Timur became Timur the Lame. Because most historians, both medieval and modern, agree that it was during this time that Timur will receive his life-altering wounds. But more on that next episode. Thanks for listening to the show. If you're new here, welcome. We're glad you're here with us on this journey. If you want to reach out to me for any reason, feel free to email me at timmerpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow the show on Facebook at TimmerPod or on Twitter at Podcast Timmer. We are getting ever closer to that fateful day when Timmer will be declared as Amir of Transoxiana, but we still have quite a ways to go. Join me next time for the next chapter right here on the Timmer Podcast. <laughs>